So currently, we will have um, a bit more advanced courses and more of them. So that will be actually more speakers, more courses. Um, and we probably are going to still have some changes in the schedule uh, on the call, but um, maybe who knows, maybe we will think we will be added away. Um, anyway, the first lecture today is uh, Jeff Kalkowski. So the lecture is going to be recorded and he is using my so it will be slightly different experience. Oh, yeah, if it's too loud or something, I don't know if it's playing. But anyway, thank you for the invitation to be here. And I, I'm going to be talking about gauge transform, which I guess you've already seen some of last week in, in Alex Sobolev's course. But I'm going to take a slightly different uh, approach to it. And um, and we're going to see some new features which occur because of what are known as as resonance zones. So let me start by um, just telling you what the overall goal of the course is. So what we want to do is we want to think about just as as I think you saw last week, we want to think about the Schrodinger operator like this, right? So there's just the usual Schrodinger operator. And I'm going to insist that V is what's known as uniform, uniformly smoothly bounded, uh, real valued. And what I mean by this is that the L infinity norm of any derivative of V is bounded. All right, so this is for all alpha in to the D. All right. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to, in some sense, um, understand, okay, so I'll be more precise as we go on, but our goal is to understand in some sense, okay, and I'll, the spectrum of this operator, but not all of it, and in a sort of somewhat rough way. So at high energy, all right? So, I'm going to be talking about um, asymptotics as the energy goes to infinity um, with for this spectrum. So let me try to tell you uh, what we might expect here. So um, this operator V, so we should notice that V is, OK, in some sense, small relative to the Laplacian. OK, so in, in what sense? Well, for example, right, the Laplacian, of course, maps HS to HS minus 2, and V maps HS to HS as a multiplication operator. So it's small in the sense that it preserves the regularity. And in particular, if you think about sort of the, the plane waves and, and they correspond to, ah, oh, this doesn't move, does it? Okay. Um, so if you think about plane waves, so U of X is E to the I, E to the I uh, lambda CX, where C is one. All right, so we notice that minus Laplace u of x is, of course, nothing but lambda square u of x. But v, well, v of x, v u of x is, of course, v e to the i lambda x. So that's not saying anything. But my point here is that this one has size lambda square, and this one has size 1. Right. So if you like, right, this is the spectral decomposition of the Laplacian. And what we see is that for large energies, indeed, this V is doing something small. Right. So this is nothing, you know, uh, to earth shaking, but it's one reason why you think might think uh, this is a small perturbation in some sense. However, there's a crucial way in which uh, 
v is not small, all right, so v in general is not relatively compact. So by the way, if, if you can't read anything or you just wanna ask a question, feel free to stop me. I will try to answer your questions. Um, right, in the sense that, so, so what I mean by this, of course, is that for example, v minus Laplace plus i inverse, uh, at, which maps, uh, let's say L2 to H2 is not a compact operator, not necessarily compact on L2, All right? And this, this really, is, um, this really is, is crucial because it means that you can change the, the, the spectrum in a rather dramatic way when you add this perturbation. Okay, so the times when it is relatively compact, right? So if, uh, let me do it here. If V goes to zero, as X goes to infinity, then of course this thing is compact. All right, so you need some extra decay towards infinity. And that will mean that, for example, the continuous spectrum is preserved um, and so on, right? But the point here is that if I'm really interested in this class of perturbations, CB infinity, then many things can happen, right? You can produce gaps in the spectrum, you can change the nature of the spectrum, um, and so on and so on, right? So for example, uh, there exists CB infinity V such that H has dense pure point spectrum, right? For example. So you really can make serious changes, um, serious changes to the spectrum doing this. Okay, so all of this to say that this operator we hope is small in some sense, but nevertheless might change the spectrum in a dramatic way. So, okay, the point, and so nevertheless, we want to think of this as small. We'd like to think that V is small at high energy. All right, so we'd like to think that. Okay, and the reason high energy again is motivated by facts like this, right? If I take something which is in a, in a sort of the, the spectral decomposition for the Laplacian with large eigenvalue, then the Laplacian looks much bigger than V. Okay, so what do I really, what do I really mean by this? So I want to, to start to tell you, again, this is all sort of what is the goal of the course. So now to tell you what I mean by, I want to think of this thing as small, um, I'm gonna need to define or recall uh, the spectral projector for, for H. So onto some interval I. So what do I mean by this? I mean the operator E, and I'm gonna try to be, well, okay, we'll see. So I mean the operator E, H, I, which is, okay, given by the spectral calculus or the functional calculus, I'm gonna take the indicator function of the interval I evaluated on H, right? So this is a nice operator defined via the spectral theorem. Right, and what it tells you is that, you know, what are the, you know, what part of your function lives in the interval, the spectral interval I for the operator H. And I'm going to want some derivatives of this type of, op not, derivatives not in the sense of differentiation, but things you can derive from this. So the spectral function for H is, and maybe I'm going to run out of space, so maybe I do this on the next uh, next board. So the spectral function for H, this is um, E H. Okay, I'm going to do it like this, even though Leonid won't like it. 
Okay, is what this is the kernel of, is the kernel of, so the integral kernel of um, indicator minus infinity lambda, or sorry, rho squared, excuse me, of h, or in other words, of e h minus infinity rho squared. Okay, so this is the spectral function for this operator h, and I should remark that, okay, one can check a priori, this is just a distribution, right? This is the integral kernel of some operator, but one can check in a, in a reasonably straightforward way, and you can do this if you, if you like for yourself, that this e of h rho xy is actually a smooth function of xy. Right, and that comes from the fact that you know you have elliptic regularity for for um, this operator h. <clears throat> okay, and I'll also use the notation that e h of rho is nothing but e h minus infinity rho squared. Okay, so we have these operators, and the reason I, I want to introduce these operators is because I want to try to tell you what do I mean by the fact that I'm hoping, at least, that a V like this is a small perturbation. That's what we're, that's what we're hoping. <laughs> so one knows, um, right, this doesn't move. I, I just, so one knows precisely the value of E minus Laplace row X, Y for every row, right? You know this exactly. <clears throat> this is known exactly. And it's easy to compute and, and we'll do so later on. But um, one of the properties it has is that this E minus Laplace rho at x, x for example, um, is asymptotic to a big sum of a j uh, rho to the d minus 2j. I think that's the right numerology. All right, so it has a complete asymptotic expansion in powers of rho. And it's, so it's a very well-behaved object as rho goes to infinity. Okay, so I should tell you what I mean by this. So I, <clears throat> you have this estimate for any n. So for all n, there exists a cn like that. Okay, so, so this is a very well-behaved function. I mean, and again, it's, it's much, it's simple to compute this thing. And it's nice and sort of regular, smooth as rho goes to infinity, All right? I mean, in fact, of course, we know everything about the spectral measure here. It's a, it's, it's a smooth function times the Lebesgue density. And, and what we want to see is, is something like this still true? So the question, is something like this true for H? That's what we want to think about um, in this course. Okay, and so I want to point out a few things that you know if you have a formula like this, you know, for example, that if there are gaps in the spectrum, then they're very narrow. At, as rho goes to infinity. In fact, they're smaller than rho to the minus any power, right? So you're, you know that there's no big gaps in the spectrum. You know you have good estimates on sort of how much mass this thing places in any interval. So a lot of properties are preserved that are preserved for the Laplacian. So now let me give this thing a name. <clears throat> This, this, this object here, so definition, E H 
row x x is called the local density of states h x. And then this carries a lot of information um, about the spectrum and, and the eigenfunctions or, 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 or generalized eigenfunctions of your operator. And there's a very nice conjecture due to Paranofsky and Sternberg, which says the following. So suppose that indeed V is one of these uniformly smoothly bounded uh, functions. Okay, then what you have is that there exist a j um, in C B infinity uh, such that so for j equals sorry j equals zero one and so on such that this e sorry is this too low. This is probably too low. Okay, even the back people are happy. So I guess I, okay. <laughs> Such that E H rho X X is asymptotic to the sum from J equals zero to infinity rho to the D minus two J A J of X. Right, so the conjecture, I mean, and there are some, some nice consequences of this that I, I may not talk about, but again, asymptotic in this sense. So when I write asymptotic, I will always mean estimates like this. Yes? Are they compactly supported? No, no. See, B infinity, it was erased a moment ago. That means uniformly smoothly bounded. That's a B. So, so write C, B infinity was V and C infinity such that for all alpha uh, dx alpha V L infinity less than C alpha. Yeah, are we happy? So these are just numbers because the Laplacian is translation invariant, but, but yeah, in principle, there's CV infinity. That's also correct, yes. <laughs> but you know, I want it to be similar, okay. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the, here of course this is a this is a dramatic overkill for for what you actually have, right? I mean, you you know the formula. It's not asymptotic. It's an equality. <clears throat> okay, so. In other words, this local density of states should have a complete asymptotic expansion in powers of rho, right? And actually, maybe I will, because I think it's nice. Let me tell you one consequence of this, but I'm not gonna tell you why. So this is equivalent to if V1 and V2 our CB infinity uh, and H1 HI is minus Laplace plus VI. <clears throat> then if uh, V1 equal V2 in a neighborhood of X, we have E H one row X X minus E H two row X X is less than C N row to the minus N for any N. And so it turns out that this thing is equivalent to some property that the spectral function only cares about local information, or the, at least on the diagonal, it only cares about local information on your potentials V1 and V2. 
So I just think this is a very nice consequence of this, this sort of estimate. So I, I'm not going to tell you why these are equivalent, but just so you know, statements like this can be derived. OK, and this conjecture in this generality is still very open. OK, so let me tell you um, when it is known. The conjecture is known in, in some situations. So the only time I can tell you that the conjecture is known for all CB infinity functions is when the dimension equals one. Sorry, there should be no D there. So then indeed, this conjecture is, is true. And you, you have a full asymptotic expansion no matter, uh, no matter what CV infinity potential you choose. <clears throat> Another time when this is known, OK, I guess I should tell you that this is work of myself, Arnowski, and Sternberg. Another time where this is known is in dimension bigger than two. So, OK, I can't. I have trouble deciding whether dimension is D or N. Um, I think D is better, but somehow, okay, well, let's try to stick with D. Um, okay, we can try to, we'll try to stick with D, but we'll take Leonid's advice, you know, if I screw it up. Uh, um, so if D is bigger than two and V is uh, almost periodic, and CV infinity, of course, plus some extra technical generic assumption. So generic extra assumptions. So then again, you know this fact, and that's due to Parnowski and Sternberg. Okay, and finally, uh, there's one other large class of potentials for which this is known, which is if D is bigger than two, and V is decaying fast. So again, CV infinity and decaying fast towards infinity. So for example, compactly supported or Schwartz, or, but you can do better than that. OK, and this is in some sense classical. So I, I, I don't know the correct uh, reference for this. Uh, I mean, we think they're not required because we think this is true for all CB infinity functions, but this is, you know, yeah. So I'm fairly certain that some of them can be relaxed. I mean, we have some ideas for relaxing some of them, but, you know, uh, it remains to be seen. OK, so this is uh, more or less the, the state of the art for when these things are known. I mean, you can generalize the, the potential to something a little bit wider in class, but, but uh, this is more or less the state of the art. And um, I want to point out that uh, when it exists, asymptotics of this type, so this is local density of states. So, and okay, I should be careful here, which is to say that the constants here, I, I claim should be, um, so down here, the implied constants should be uniform in X. Okay. So when it exists, the asymptotics for the LDS imply corresponding asymptotics for the integrated density of states, which I remind you is given by, what's the notation I want to use? Uh, N of H rho. Uh, yeah, one over, okay. I, I actually am not sure if I got the normalization constants correct, but you know, um, We'll have to deal with that. So what we do is we average 
the local density of states over a big ball of radius r to the d. And sorry, I should take a limit, of course. And I send r to infinity. Right, so this is, I did, Alex, did you, did you give this definition last time? Alex is on his phone, you know. <laughs> okay, so you saw this definition last week. Thank you, thank you, Alex. And, and so you can, uh, you can get asymptotics for the integrated density of states directly from this type of asymptotics, of course, provided the constants are uniform in X and the integrated density of states exists. So for example, <clears throat> uh, if your potential is periodic and you have such a thing, then you have also full asymptotic expansion for the integrated density of states. And I suppose, so I've been told that this type of object might be more familiar to this audience than the local density of states. Although for me, the local density of states is much more familiar than the integrated density of states. Okay, so, so this is sort of the background, right? So we have this conjecture, which tells you in some sense quantitatively how small such a uniformly smoothly bounded potential is relative to the Laplacian from a spectral point of view. And, you know, we'd like to prove this for as large a class of functions as possible. But because I am not too mean, I think, hopefully, we're going to only do this in some very special cases. Okay. So the plan for us is not to prove. Uh, this full asymptotic expansion in this generality or in the in the sort of state of the art generality that would take us too long but it's to illustrate some of the ideas that go into this namely um, I, I mean the gauge transform and some analysis inside resonance zones for uh, certain classes of potentials so the plan for this course now is to prove, is to focus on the smooth and periodic, okay? And then we're gonna do two things. <laughs> we're going to, in dimension one, we're going to really prove a full asymptotic expansion for the local density of states. And in dimension two, uh, we're going to prove the full asymptotic expansion. Okay, not for the local density of states, but for the integrated density of states. Okay, and the reason for this is just to avoid some technical nastiness uh, at the end. So this is the integrated density of states. But as a I, most of the ideas um, are the same. There's just a little bit of sort of extra nastiness that you have to deal with if you want to get the local density of states. Okay, so is the, is the goal clear and the way we want to think about the perturbation being small clear? That's sort of what I wanted to get this far. So periodic, right? I'm doing only periodic, yeah. So in full generality, no, it's not known in dimension two, but for periodic functions, it's not. Any other questions? Okay, so the first thing I want to discuss then, um, I'm always losing the eraser. Okay, the first thing I wanna discuss is what is the, what is the strategy of proof here? By the way, do I take the full hour or do I take 50 minutes? So what is the strategy? Okay, so in my notes, you know, strategy plus some abstract nonsense. Okay, so what's the strategy here? Well, <clears throat> the first thing we're going to try to do well, it obviously is to simplify the problem, right? So we start with uh, H is minus Laplace plus V. Again, V 
periodic and smooth. Okay, so for the, the strategy, of course, is more general than that, but that's the situation we're going to be thinking about. And so the first thing we want to do is we want to figure out um, how much we can just, so the question, how much can we just change, change V without affecting uh, the LDS? So more precisely, I want to find some H1 such that E H1 rho X X minus E H rho X X. Okay, and now I, let me introduce this notation is order rho to the minus infinity. So this notation means there exists for all n, there exists cn such that my quantity is less than cn rho to the minus n. All right, so I will use this notation over and over again. Okay, so this is this is sort of, you know, one has to be rather careful about what you do here. But for example, you might hope that uh, that making just a small change to the operator is enough to do this, you would be wrong. But and we'll see why in a moment. But this is the first thing we we first want to make a change, which doesn't affect the uh, local density of states, and which in fact may be big. So we're going to see that this is possible. Um, if the change, if the difference, if H1, H minus H1 is, okay, quote unquote, far from the energy level. Okay, so I will explain all of this in much more, with much more care later, uh, rho square, all right? So if I make a change which doesn't see, say, the eigenfunctions of H1 near rho or the eigenfunctions of H near rho, then this should be okay. And we're going to see that that is indeed the case. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Okay, so the next thing um, we want to do and you know the reason we're all here in some sense because I was told give a course on the gauge transform, so I'd better put a gauge transform on the board. So apply the gauge transform. Okay, so I mean I feel like I have to I have to say it. This this name for for this process. There's many other names for this thing. Um, this is the name given to it in the periodic community, as far as I understand. It also goes by Moser averaging or, okay, KAM theory in some sense, but we're going to call it the gauge transform. Okay. But if you want to look up history of this thing, you might look for these other names as well. Um, so what's the idea? And you, you, you saw a version of this last week. We're going to try to construct a unitary operator u such that u h1 okay then now i mean it doesn't really matter but just so i'm i'm consistent with myself is h2 okay plus something small and so that h2 is somehow simpler, like closer to diagonal, right? That's the idea. This is almost a diagonalization, or it wants to be a diagonalization. And small is going to be small in a sense that I can apply this type of apply this type of result. So small in the sense that it doesn't change the density of states very much. 
right? And this is the gauge transform. And I should say it's it's crucial here that you really construct you. I mean, there, there shouldn't be any compactness arguments or things like this going into this. You want to know what U is for the purposes of computing the local density of states, because of course, the local density of states is not unitarily invariant. Right? So you really have to know this thing. <clears throat> okay, and then what we want to do is of course compute E H2 rho XX, or more precisely show that it has a full asymptotic expansion in powers of rho. Okay, and now there's a slightly funny, um, funny feature to this whole thing is that in some sense, there's a fourth step here at the end, which is to show that actually all of these changes you made did what you said they did. Right? And I'll explain that at the end. So show, show that actually all the changes were okay. So notice in particular, I've thrown away something small here, thrown away something here. Um, all the changes were okay. Okay, and I'll explain that in, in just a moment. <clears throat> okay, so that's the overall strategy. It's just make a potentially big change to H away from the energy surface you're interested in, then diagonalize the resulting thing and or almost diagonalize the resulting thing in some sense, then compute the spectral function and then make sure at the end that all the hypotheses you actually needed to show that these changes were small are okay. Okay, so that's, that's the strategy. Um, okay, so now we need to discuss what kind of perturbations you can get away with and still have the spectral projectors be close or the spectral functions be close. So what sort of perturbations can preserve or almost preserve the local density of states? And the crucial first observation is that H1 minus H2 small actually need not imply E H1 rho XX or minus E H2 rho XX small or, 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 or indeed the corresponding operators. So, or E. Okay, and it's very easy to see this. So let's, let's check this. You know, at some point you have to start doing math and not just waving one's hands. But don't worry, this one is easy. So if I take H1 is just a diagonal matrix, which looks like that. <clears throat> and H2 is like this. So I hope we all agree that if epsilon is small, this perturbation is small. Um, Okay, but now what happens if we look at the corresponding spectral projectors? So notice E H one of uh, square root of two, I suppose, is the identity. Yes, because the whole spectrum of this, um, this matrix is below two, less than or equal to two. But EH2 of, of square root of two is well one zero zero uh, indicator zero infinity of epsilon. So, if epsilon is tiny and negative, these are extremely different, right? This is very far from the identity. So epsilon less than zero, this is a big change. I know that's not allowed, but you know, 
Okay, let's not call it epsilon. Let's call it S. Now it's allowed. This is a big change. <laughs> okay, and of course, you know, this is a finite dimensional thing. So no matter which topology I choose here, this is a big perturbation, right? There's no, there's no, there's no fussing about with, uh, with uh, topology to sort of make this go away. <clears throat> and so what's the problem here? So the problem is that there's a lot of spectrum, quote unquote, a lot of spectrum for H1 uh, near uh, rho equals square root two. But there's a lot of spectrum at this energy level. In particular, there's a whole eigenvalue there. There's no, you know, there's no messing about with it. There's really something of size one living at square root of two. Okay. And so what happens, of course, is that you know I have this eigenvalue at square root of two. I change the thing slightly. Uh, oh, did I do the did I do the wrong thing? No, I I guess I sorry. Somebody should have uh, somebody should have stopped me. You know. Yeah, exactly. That's how it works. Um, it was it was okay. I could have used an epsilon. You know. <laughs> right. Because. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so sorry, sorry about that. But you see that what happens is if um, if this S is big, what happens is that whole eigenvalue gets pushed up above the energy level, right? Just gets pushed to the right above the energy level. And all of a sudden we lose a huge proportion of this spectral projector. It's just gone, right, like that. And it's because we have this, this eigenvalue, right? We have mass one right at that energy level. It can be easily pushed up. Okay, so, so notice, notice if I choose, um, if I choose rho squared, not in the spectrum of H1, then indeed, E of H1 rho uh, minus E of H2 rho is small. I have this problem where if I write, want to write two letters next to each other, I lose one somehow, two of the same letter. If this is small, then um, this is small if H1 minus H2 is small. So if indeed rho squared is not in the spectrum of, the, of H1, then I can make this perturbation and everything is okay. So, so we are really seeing something genuine here. It's the presence of this spectrum, or at least a lot of this spectrum at this energy level, which is causing us problems when we make a perturbation. Okay, but you know this is far too strong an assumption for our purposes to really say rho squared is not in the spectrum of our operator. This is far too strong an assumption because you'll notice that, um, that you know, the spectrum of minus Laplacian is of course all of the positive half line, right? And indeed we expect, you know, because of the Beth Sommerfeld conjecture, we know for a periodic V sort of, most of the positive half line is in the spectrum, all but finite, all but a finite part. Okay, so it's too much to assume that rho squared uh, is really not in the spectrum of my operator. <clears throat> okay, so now what we want to do is weaken slightly this assumption, right? We don't want to say rho squared is not in the spectrum. We want to say there's not a lot of spectrum at, at this energy level. And OK, I'm, we're, we'll get there in a moment. But that's where we're going. We want to say that if there's not a lot of spectrum near rho squared, then indeed I can make a small perturbation and everything is 
is hunky dory. Okay, and and um, actually, since we're going to be working with the local density of states, we're going to do something even slightly weaker than that. So let's notice now that E H rho x x can be written in the following way. This is the inner product of E H rho applied to the delta function at x, if you like, um, and paired with the delta function at x. This is nothing. I haven't done anything. This is just writing the integral kernel in a slightly funny way. And then because this is a projector, a self-adjoint projector, I can write this like this. So what we're interested in then is what can I do to this operator h to make a small change in its action on the delta function? All right. So in some sense, we're going to work, i.e. work in something like the strong operator topology. Strong, weak, I don't know, strong. You know, that's the trouble with infinite dimensions. There's too many topologies. Okay, and again, our problem here is that, okay, even let's say if we forgot that we were in finite dimensions, uh, but if we apply this sort of argument and we look at the application to the eigenfunction exactly in this eigenvalue eigenspace with eigenvalue two, and we try to do this, we have a problem, right? I mean, we're going to lose it when we uh, make s bigger, right? So, and that's again because there's a lot of spectrum near two. So, what we're going to do is we're going to weaken the assumption that rho squared not be in the spectrum, and the way we're going to weaken it is we're going to assume that this type of object uh, is small. So E H1 uh, onto rho squared minus a number. Okay, I is probably bad for my handwriting, so let me not call it I. Uh, let's call it epsilon. So what do I want? I want to do this in the strong operator topology. So we want to assume in this case, and I'm really interested exactly in the delta function, I want to assume that this object is small. OK, as a function of that epsilon. Right, and that's a quantitative version of having not very much spectrum, at least when projected onto the delta function at energy rho squared. Right, And so that's this weakening of the fact that here we said, if rho squared is really not in the spectrum, then of course the perturbation we made was fine. Right? There's no issue with comparing the two spectral projectors. But as I said, the Laplacian has spectrum on the whole half line. So it's hopeless to try to assume that rho is not in the spectrum or rho squared is not in the spectrum. But maybe it's enough to assume something like this. Right, that there's a little bit of spectrum near rho squared, but it's controlled as epsilon goes to zero. And if you check, again, one can check uh, that if you have a full asymptotic expansion in powers of rho, so if E H1 rho xx has a full asymptotic expansion in rho, then this number um, E H1 rho square minus epsilon rho square plus epsilon. Uh, let me, okay, just because it's going to make my life simpler, I'm going to change this to an open bracket. Okay, so it'll become clear in just a second why. Um, this thing, <clears throat> this is equal to E H1 
squared of rho squared plus epsilon xx minus e h1 squared of rho squared minus epsilon xx. <laughs> and you'll notice that this thing, and, and sorry, this should be uh, delta x in L2, uh, I guess I want, maybe with a square. <clears throat> and this thing is less than, um, I suppose, a constant, say times epsilon, there's some powers of rho that don't really matter. If epsilon is bigger than some constant rho to the minus n. Right. So what we see is that a full asymptotic expansion for this local density of states implies there can't be too much spectrum here, or in particular, there can't be too much of the delta function at x in the, in the spectral projector for h1 near this energy level rho, rho squared. Right. <clears throat> okay. And so what this means is that if we can complete this process, namely make the change at the beginning, make the gauge transform, compute the spectral function for the operator we get to, then that last operator will satisfy this assumption, right? That's the point. And then you go back and you say, aha, well, actually the previous one satisfied this assumption because I'm gonna see, we'll see in a moment that Indeed, having this assumption is enough to show that two spectral functions are close. And then you go up like that, back to the beginning. OK, and all right, so I guess I'm out of time. And it's a good place to stop. So the thing we're going to do next is we're going to check that indeed an assumption like this is enough to show that a small perturbation of H1, OK, in some sense, produces uh, a small perturbation of the spectral function.